let me record. Thank you, Malika. What would I do without you? Malika is one of our panelists later, and she's actually has a company called Evanston Live TV. So thank God she remembers to record because that's <laughs> what she always does. So Malika, thank you for reminding me. Um, those of you that know the New Tour Democrats events well know that like five minutes in, I realize I'm not recording. So thank God for people like Malika putting me into gear. So we have just an amazing series of women and men here with us, but today we're going to learn from a crew of folks that are just doing such great work, and then we're going to hear from some panelists. So a little bit of the lay of the land, you're going to get to hear from some of the new chair Democrats leaders. We're going to go into hearing about six amazing organizations that I think there's a ton of overlap in. So one of my favorite things about Zoom is getting to see everybody in these little boxes, which amplifies how we all know each other and seeing that overlap and in that virtual space. And so we'll get to hear from some of our leaders. Then I'm gonna kick it off to Representative Jennifer Gong Gershowitz to lead us in a panel discussion with three amazing women, including Malika Gardner, who thank goodness has us recording. We're also going to hear from Wendy Baum, who's with Investor Elect, and Dil Nazwayrash, who is part of numerous things, but I always see her in the light that she does for the Muslim community and her philanthropy. So thank you everyone for being here. I want to take a moment to introduce Dean Maragos. And you'll have to excuse me, this is a big event. So if you see me scrolling through people, that's because I just have to make sure that I am spotlighting the right person. And so Dean, if you could turn on your video, that would be awesome. That way we can all see you. Everyone, Dean Maragos is the committee person here at New Chair Democrats. And we'd love to hear a few words from you, Dean. Dean, are you with us? I don't see him. He's muted. I don't even see his little name. Oh, here he is, Dean. Are you there? I don't see anything. I don't see muted. I don't see him at all. Are you there? I don't see his name. I see his name, but I don't see him. And I don't even see the little red. Oh, there. No, that's Joan. Dean. You know what, Judy? I'm going to kick off to you. That so sounds good. Many of you know, we'll Judy Mandel, this is the president of New Shore Democrats. I'm going to have her say a few words as I troubleshoot with Dean for a second. Okay, um, well, uh, first of all, I wanna welcome all our uh, members and guests to this wonderful program that Alexandra has put together. Um, it's an important month, Women's History Month, and she's assembled a great team of women to talk about activism and women's participation in it, because I think as women, we do a great job in the world of activism. And so I wanna thank also Jennifer Gong Gershowitz, who is going to lead this panel. And I, I want to just end uh, with something very important. I, I think that the election coming up April 6th is important. Local elections are very important. So I want to make sure that everybody, if you have a mail-in ballot, make sure you mail it in or drop it off at the Skokie Courthouse. Um, otherwise, it's early voting at Centennial if you live in Wilmette. And uh, election day is April 6th. So uh, Alexandra, thanks so much for putting this together. And uh, Dean, say hi. <laughs> there. Dean, I'm just asking you to start your video once more. We'd love to have you say a few words. Mm -hmm. Dean, are you with us? I don't hear him. I okay, friends. It seems like we might be having some technical difficulty. So my game plan is if and when Dean's camera begins working in a little bit, I will chime him in, in between some of the other things that we're doing, but I know how valuable everyone's time is and how excited we are to hear from our amazing speakers today. So in this case, I'm really excited. So first of all, as I noted, seeing all these little boxes just reminds me of all the cool overlaps. I recently had the opportunity of becoming a member of ITE, so Invest to Elect, and seeing all of those collisions of where so many people are members has been so exciting. And I see the same thing in these amazing organizations. So today we're gonna to get to hear from IDW, which is Illinois Democratic Women, we will, which stands for Women Empowering Women in Local Legislation, now the National Organization for Women, Jack Pack, which, excuse me, I don't know your entire acronym, but you guys are the amazing Jewish women making things happen in our community. We have the North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic, and we have Moms Demand Action. So, so many of these organizations that we get to get engaged with coalitions on, we get to participate and do wonderful things with them. We're going to get to hear from some of those leaders. So, I'm going to start us off with Kim Savage, who's the co-president alongside of Jennifer Lee over at IDW. Kim, what do you guys have going on? 
Well, thank you for inviting us. I had to make sure I wasn't muted. Uh, Illinois Democratic Women is a grassroots organization that covers statewide of Democratic women. We have some local groups in a lot of the Collar counties, DuPage, Kane, Kendall, the South Suburbs, and uh, also in the uh, Macomb area. And we're working with and Kankakee, and we have another group starting up in Southern Illinois. But we're working to try and build out more uh, engagement with Democratic women. We also have also been working closely with legislators, uh, with the House Democratic Women's Caucus, and some of the uh, Senate women leaders to uh, help try and amplify some of the legislation that is going on. We also are a member of the National Federation of Democratic Women. So I belong to the legislative committee for that group. So we're trying to work at a lot of different levels. I know we've partnered with some of the other organizations that are on this Zoom tonight to um, push different uh, legislative topics. And we look forward to doing more of that in the future. And we are so ready for COVID to be over so that we can do these things in person. Thank you, Kim. And you hit on something really important that I think many of us work really hard to do. I feel really lucky to live in the North Shore. I live in Wilmette with my family. I have four kids. But what Kim has really done is mobilize the entire state. And so Kim's organization not only has members here in the North Shore, but all over the state. And as many of you know, building coalitions and amplifying women's rights issues doesn't just happen in our own backyard, but throughout the state. And so Kim's organization, IDW, has a presence throughout the state and it's really quite amazing. So thank you for everything that you guys are doing, Kim. Um, it's always wonderful to participate in your organization. Well, thank Erica. you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Erica Walker, what do you guys have going on at We Will? Sheer enthusiasm right now. So I think most of us uh, know We Will that it stands for Women Empowering Women in Local Legislation. So we are so happy to be able to continue to host our legislative coffees via Zoom. We recently had Representative Buckner, Representative um, uh, Mayfield, and we are having our first in-person legislative coffee date uh, coming up on the 5th. It's going to be outside of a coffee shop with uh, Representative Croak, and we hope that goes well, being outside, enjoying the weather, mask on still. But it's just a really great way to have some intimate conversations with our legislators in ways that you might not be able to do ordinarily. We continue to um, fight for um, issues and bills that are important to women and girls and social justice issues. And so we are just uh, began to announce our legislative agenda. You'll see that online very soon. And then I'm most excited that we just support each other. We have networking events every other week so that women entrepreneurs can be there for one another. If there are personal things going on that we can celebrate, um, that we can support, we do that. And so that's us in a nutshell. Thank you, Erica. That's fantastic. It's been very impressive seeing the legislative agenda that you guys passed this past session. And we're all excited for the cool work you guys are doing. And we'll get to hear a little bit about that later when we hear Malika speak as well. So next up, we have Iris Aglarsh, who I feel like, Iris, we get to hang out all the time on Zoom. I can't wait to see you in person. Iris is the, lead, Iris is the leader of the NOW chapter here in the North Shore area. Iris, what do you guys have going on? Okay. Well, first of all, our chapter name is North Northwest Suburban Chicago Chapter of NOW, and uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. My chapter has a far-flung membership and primarily goes all the way from Evanston on the east, up through Highland Park, west to Deerfield, then south through Northbrook, Glenview, Skokie, then west to Wheeling, Palatine, Arlington Heights, and Mount Prospect, and many places in between. We also have several members who live in the city of Chicago. As many of you know, the NOW organization is a multi-issue grassroots feminist organization that works at local, state, and national levels to bring about positive change for women. For more than 50 years, NOW has been a major force 
in putting more women in politics, political posts, increasing education, employment and business opportunities for women, and enacting tougher laws against violence, harassment, discrimination. My chapter is dedicated to advancing equality for all, and our mission includes defending reproductive rights, standing up against abuse and violence against women, and supporting the inclusion of diverse voices and experiences. Our next, um, our next, at our last Zoom meeting, I just wanted to mention, we had an exciting, exciting meeting where US Representative Lauren Underwood spoke to us about the Mo Momnibus Act, which she introduced to Congress. Our next Zoom meeting will take place on Wednesday, April 21st, when Audrey Thomas, the CEO of Deborah's Place in Chicago, will speak. If many of you probably know about Deborah's Place, but uh, they open doors of opportunity and help women who are experiencing homelessness in the city of Chicago. Um, if you're interested in joining my chapter of NOW, go to now.org and specify Illinois IL0010, which is our chapter number. We're also interested in co-sponsoring events with other pro-feminist organizations. Thank you. Awesome, Iris, thank you. And this reminds me, if everyone of our key leaders right now could please put the link to their organization in the chat, that would be great. I know some of us have become Zoom pros. You can find your chat by going to the bottom bar. And if you click chat, it'll open up a right-hand panel or an overlay panel. And if you guys could pop your link to your um, organization in there, that would be great. We have next up Marsha. Oh, with Alexandra, could you please let in um, Dean? He's waiting. He is already here. And yes, I'm going to introduce Marsha, and I'm working on troubleshooting Dean already. I well, know he's trying yeah, to. Yeah, he. I, I just was on the phone with him, and he's, he's waiting for you to let him in. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marsha. Thank Marcia. you. I'm actually queuing another Marsha, very popular. I know Marsha Balanick, and I say, so, hi, Marsha. Hi, Marsha. <laughs> so Marsha Balanick, so interestingly, right prior to the pandemic hitting, I had just signed up excitedly to go with Jack Pack to DC. And it was going to be this amazing April trip. It was going to be the first trip I got to take without my kids or husband. And I was looking so forward to lobbying with you in DC. And then of course the pandemic hit, which I feel like is the story of so many of our lives. This was happening then the pandemic. But Marsha, I'm so excited to hear what, what Jack Pack has going on. Please share with us and friends as we're doing that, I'm going to work on getting Dean. So bear with me. Um, Marsha, tell us all about Jack Pack, please. I'm happy to, and I thank you for inviting me to tell you about Jack Pack. I'm proud to be with all of you other activists. Um, I am the executive director and Jack Pack stands for Joint Action Committee for Political Affairs. It's a national group. Uh, mm -hmm. It was founded in 1981, right after the 1980 elections, right here in Illinois. Um, Jack became the first national women's PAC we gave a voice to women around the country. Our issues started with Israel and the separation of religion and state. We evolved from that after the Webster decision in 1989 and we adopted women's reproductive rights. After Sandy Hook, we took on the gun violence prevention and we sit on a national gun violence prevention table. We also adopted the environment. We raised money to support federal candidates, senators, congressmen, the president, um, through membership. And uh, your membership, we get, through your membership, we give direct to the candidates or through conduit checks that you write and um, either directly, write directly to the candidate and, uh, or use our designated link. And we deliver these dollars to senators, congressmen, and candidates. And instead of them not knowing what issues you care about, if they get their contribution from Jackpack, they know what you care about. Um, it's important to help people, uh, congressional leaders all around the country. I think what you do locally and what we do locally here in Illinois is very important. But as you can see what's going on in the Senate right now, we need every, every uh, voice we can. Um, happening there. So every vote counts, especially what's going on with voter suppression right now. We, 
we really hope that we can pass something at, um, and so we need to be more responsible to what's going on around the country too. Um, your membership pre-COVID, we had we had conferences in Washington, we had in-person meetings. Now we do Zoom meetings. Our next Zoom meeting is going to be April 6th with Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. And the following, um, we're having uh, Abigail Spanberger from Virginia, April 26th. Um, we do an easy read every week. So we want to keep our women educated. And that's a compilation of articles and facts. Uh, we do action alerts and we do GOTV opportunities around the country. I, I just, uh, I use a famous quote by Ben Franklin and it says, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. So go to our website, jackpack.org, become involved with us, but all of you are involved and I'm so excited that I could be part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marsha. The work you guys are doing is fantastic. I'm really excited to introduce Rebecca Weininger next, and many of us have had the opportunity to work with her organization, North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic. This is a place that many of us have had friends go, neighbors go, fellow women in our community, and it's really become a beacon for hard times, but also just day-to-day -day living life. And I know how busy you guys are right now because I keep getting asked, do you know how long the wait list is at North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic? And it is long, but we're I mean, and you ladies are just doing amazing things. So Rebecca, tell us all about what you guys have going on. Thanks. Um, Alyssa, just wanted to note that you're here with us as well right. and I know all the work that you do um, for the clinic. And then friends, if you're not speaking currently, if I could just remind you to mute, we love hearing your kids and your dogs and your TVs, but it makes it hard to hear the speakers. Rebecca, tell us all about it. Sandra, this is Dean Marigus. I just want to apologize for being late and how happy I am to be with all of you. And I apologize, I had technical difficulties. Dean, I plan to introduce you in a little bit. We're gonna let a couple more speakers Great, go. Great, no problem. Honored to be here, Alexandra, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. I am honored to be with you. I am honored by the work that you do. Um, I can't wait to lift you all up in the work that, that we're doing and, and to partner with you in any way possible. My name is Rebecca Weininger. I'm the director of the Domestic Violence Law Practice at the North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic. We are a pro bono legal services clinic in the areas of domestic violence, immigration, and housing um, for all of Northern suburban Cook County and all of Lake County. In-house, we speak Spanish, Polish, and Korean. In the DV practice, we represent survivors of domestic violence and domestic violence court uh, in terms of orders of protection and family court um, for divorces and parentage cases, which are just cases of people who aren't married um, but have children in common. Um, and when I say domestic violence, what I mean is intimate partner violence, sexual assault, bullying, stalking, harassment, um, the, the entire umbrella um, of abuse um, as defined by the Illinois Domestic Violence Act. As you can imagine, the need has absolutely skyrocketed during this pandemic. Before the pandemic, we averaged about 20 new cases a month, and we are going to hit 50 new cases this month um, on the North Shore. Um, we, have we have responded uh, to this need creatively, and I, I would like to just walk you through a few of the things that we've done, um, which wouldn't have been possible without Alyssa Noble, um, my, my sister in, in all of this. Um, one of the bright lights to, to come out of, of the pandemic um, is Alyssa's light. Um, we we want to we find survivors and reach them creatively, safely, and discreetly. And to do that, we have created a, a website, bananabreadhelp.com. Um, it is a site that looks like a banana bread recipe, but in it is embedded all kinds of domestic violence resources. Um, so it leaves no digital footprint uh, beyond looking like you're looking up a banana bread recipe, but in it, there are videos of my face um, talking, but closed captioned so that you can watch it silently, um, links, um, to all kinds of uh, resources, um, immigration and housing uh, as well. Um, and to build on the uh, success of the Banana Bread website, we are now doing Banana Bread Baking Zooms every month 
We host a banana bread baking Zoom in which on the screen, my daughter and I are baking banana bread. And in the chat, we are answering questions about domestic violence. So a survivor can log on anonymously and get answers in the chat in English and in Spanish about divorce and domestic violence and rights um, and, and anything that's on their mind, they can come and chat and they can do that anonymously. And if a, an abuser walks by, it looks like they're taking a cooking Zoom like we all do to fill some time um, these days. We also have a survivor guide um, that is local to the North Shore, um, filled with uh, local links and information about how to get identify if you're in an abusive relationship and how to get out and what your rights are. Um, and we provide that um, to anyone who's interested. We also provide flyers with a QR code that can just be scanned on a phone and it takes you right to that flyer on our website. And the help that I'm asking for today is let us send you a survivor guide. Let us send you flyers. Um, you can put them up in discrete places. We're giving them to libraries. We're giving them to retail stores. We're giving them to grocery stores, anybody, doctor's offices. I've met with tons of doctors. Um, to put it up in places where survivors might be alone and they can scan and get information discreetly um, and on their time um, uh, about how to, how to survive um, and how to get to us um, and help us publish the website, bananabreadhelp.com and the Zooms that we hold every month for survivors. Thank you again for including me and for all of the work that you're doing. It's truly an honor to be with all of you. Rebecca, thank you. And I can tell that I'm not alone by seeing the women's faces here. I think we've all been impacted by various levels of domestic violence. And this banana bread program you guys are doing is really special mm -hmm. and super amazing and just very in cue with today's hour, this pandemic hour where we're spending so much time on Zoom and we're in our homes so much more. So thank you for what you're doing to protect women and families everywhere. It's really critical work. So thank you. Carlene McAllister is with us with Moms Demand Action. Moms Demand Action is everywhere. It seemed like one day it was a couple women. Now it's thousands of women across the nation, men and women doing great things. And Carlene is one of our local leaders. Carlene, what do you have going on? Are you worried about baseball season here? Okay. Um, first of all, maybe you recognize the shirt. This, it's a fairly distinctive shirt, Moms Demand Action. And I'm the local group leader for the Wilmette Skokie Evanston Moms Demand Action Group. The national group was started five years ago by Shannon Watts after the Sandy Hook mass shooting. She started a Facebook group to try to get together with other moms who were equally devastated and start trying to organize. And um, since then, uh, it's grown. There's now 6 million supporters nationwide. So we passed the NRA supporter level. And um, that is one of the many goals nationally is beat the NRA. But a primary goal is to pass gun safety legislation. The gun lobbies spent two or three decades just chipping away at things and building up a whole set of rules that led to the point where we are now with two mass shootings in a week and all the other kinds of gun violence like urban gun violence, suicide, accidental shootings, and as well as school shootings and other mass shootings. So we're working on gun laws that address a lot of those different areas. And very quickly, Moms Demand Action realized you don't get the laws passed if you don't have the candidates in office. So at the state and national level, we started endorsing candidates and then encouraging supporters to, um, you know, just be the boots on the ground, just the grassroots part of it. This isn't a big fundraising organization. There's no dues or anything like that. It's what can we do with our energy, our educational power, our determination? So passing laws, getting candidates elected, beating the NRA, and also there's an educational component trying to, uh, there's a program called Be Smart, which is trying to educate people about the importance of keeping guns locked up to prevent an accidental shooting. And um, through every town, which is a partner group, Shannon Watts joined, you know, it's, they're separate, but they collaborate. 
every town does some of the research and and some of the infrastructure that we need for the grassroots effort. Um, through them, there are also grant programs to support community-based organizations that take an evidence-based approach to reducing urban gun violence. So those are all the different ways, but in our local group, we've really focused on educating the community about our group and getting people um, to sign up for text alerts and to fill out witness slips for upcoming legislation. And our group, like most groups, has also seen supporters move on to become involved themselves, either as candidates or proposing legislation. At our last meeting, uh, a mom who lost a son in Evanston to a shooting, he was murdered several years ago, saw, suffered herself. She lost a job because she wasn't safe in, in that job as a result of the shooting. And so she's been working with Robin Gable to amend, to propose an amendment to existing legislation on support for survivors. So that is so fantastic to me. And another success is um, Carolyn Murray is, who had started her own gun buyback program, sadly lost a son also who was shot and killed, is now running um, as an alderman in Evanston. So the group is a combination of getting some research and national level endorsement and federal strategy together, as well as just a place for a grassroots effort to come together. Not everything is endorsed or, you know, official, but we can share like a common intent and get people to join our efforts. So that's what we're about. The next thing is an advocacy day to try it on April 19th, it's statewide to push for our um, goals with Springfield. Thank you. And I'll put the contact info in. Perfect, thank you. So Carlene, as you're sharing the stories of these moms that have been through gun violence and what has gone on in all of our communities, it reminds me that often what engages us, what triggers us is this moment, and it's that moment in time that puts us forward to either get out there and, you know, Carlene, you spoke about your organization. Some people are now running for office, like this person running for alderman. Some people are writing legislation. Some people, you know, found organizations. Other people join organizations. And I think that one of these junctures that's happened to so many of us lately was that Trump juncture. It was a juncture when we saw more people come into the Democratic Party than ever before. And it's been a really exciting time to see so many people want to engage. And I know that with the organizations I'm involved with, we've seen increases in membership. And now it feels like this momentum is really here. So I'm hearing from all you women, all these amazing organizations. It's really heartwarming, but I also think it's exciting to see all the work that we've done. We also know how much further we have to go. And if it's kind of those quintessential women's rights issues, if it's, you know, choice or if it's pay equity or if it's the bigger stuff that we're seeing, you know, happening not just during the pandemic, but we're seeing Asian hate. We've seen our communities, the, the inequities that are going on and our eyes are open and we're not closing them. And as women, and we have that opportunity to make that difference. I want to make sure that we all have an opportunity prior to hearing from our panel to hear from our committee person. And I want to remind everyone about a couple events. You'll get, you guys will see that Marsha um, from our board put down some information. New Chair Democrats would love to support whatever one has going on. So please keep us informed on what you're working on right now. As you know, the election, April 6th is the municipal election. If you've not already voted, please do. There's early voting at Centennial. You can also do Dropbox at the Skokie um, Courthouse. I learned very quickly with Eve Williams, who's here with us this evening from ITE, that you have to go inside to get to that box, which is a little bit negating for those of us that were trying to avoid pandemic exposure. But if you are doing the Dropbox at the Skokie Courthouse, you need to park and go inside and it's in the same area where the early voting is happening. Um, Thanks to Eve, we were able to get the staff over there trained so they could tell people where to go versus turning them away. Alexandra, I just want to say that I did that. And it's really not bad if you go at a good time. It, it, it doesn't take long. And actually, there was nobody in the room. And you'll be glad to know that the, the ballots are safe because they're in the room with the judges. So nobody can 
can do anything bad. So definitely do do drop off at the Skokie Courthouse if it's convenient for you. Thank you, Judy. I'm glad that you tested it. I was actually considering testing it myself, but now we have an in-house testee. So everyone, it's a good experience. Do it. Please vote. Also on April 10th, Lauren Underwood is coming to town. She's going to be here in Wilmette. If you're interested in doing a drive-by selfie with Lauren Underwood, we'd love to see you. And on April 26th, we have our next Nutra Democrats Forum. This forum is all about the environment. It's about water, the force of all nature. We have an amazing um, series of panelists, including Commissioner um, Deborah Shore, as well as Representative Robin Gable, and some fantastic folks in the mix. And Mary Lee, who is on the board of Nutra Democrats, has helped put on this Event and it's going to be a really great one. And so with all the excitement here in the Nutra area coming up in April, I want to take a moment to introduce Dean. Dean, we're so glad you're with us. I know we were having some video issues earlier. Oh, and now I don't see you. Now I, oh no. Oh, there he is. Perfect. Dean, our committee person. How are you? Oh, you're muted. I, I'm muted. You're now, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, I apologize for the uh, inconvenience. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you and Alexandra and all of you for coming together. What you're doing is tremendous work. As committeemen, I am committed to make sure that we, the Nutra Dems, be a major part of all the work that you've done as any way we can help. Uh, last weekend, I was uh, fortunate and invited to be at the Asian a meeting uh, to stop violence against Asians and it was in Skokie and uh, what that that is part of what we've got to do and I'm as I said as as the committee for new Trier, I can say without equivocation how proud we are of all the work you're doing and that we'll be honored to help you in any way you can any way we can and please let us know what your events uh, what uh, Alexandra has just said is important to us let us know what is there uh, you, we will bring you before the executive board to discuss the issues and we would gladly help. And once again, thank you for having us, having me here. And I can, as I say, I can speak for the Nutri Dems. We will help in any way we can and good luck. Thank you, Dean. Yes, we are excited to support everyone's organizations and the efforts they have going on. Dean did mention- Can I say one other, one thing? I, I don't mean to interrupt. I will introduce you in one second. I'm gonna wrap up what I was saying. Real oh, I'm so sorry. And so what I, Dean had just mentioned that something about events and I just wanted to come back to that real quick. So if you have an event or a program that's going on here in the North Shore area, we'd love to know about it. I know several people have dropped their um, their emails in there, but I think everyone knows how to get in touch with the New Shore Democrats and we'd love to promote your local um, democratic style events and the things that you have going on. Um, Marcia, uh, it seems like you have something to say. I'm going to find you. What's going on? What, what would you like to share before we kick off our next you know what you took the words out of my mouth Alexandra that is exactly what I wanted to say is that we will promote all of your events in our newsletter and if there is anything that we can do for any of you including putting banana bread recipes or whatever else throughout the community we will help so um, please remember that we're here for all of you and to make where we all just want to make this a better world so thank you. Thank you, Marsha. And for those of you that don't know Marsha, Marsha Blumenthal Fields, she is one of the co-chairs, the main chair of our annual dinner every year. So for those of you that don't know her, you're going to get to know her soon because we're really hoping we're going to be in person for that event in October. So without further ado, I know you guys are really excited to hear from our representative, Representative Jennifer Gongershowitz, and this amazing panel of speakers. I had the privilege of getting to know Jen when we were not friends. And so Jen and I went toe to toe for state rep. So I got to see the good and the bad in her. And what I learned is that she's amazing. She is doing such hard work for all of our communities. And she is one of the most impressive women I have met in a very long time. When she goes to work, she goes to work with all of our hearts at the table. And she has in a very short amount of time become one of the most amazing representatives here in the house and is just kicking butt and taking names. Not only is she doing the great work for all of us, she's a wonderful attorney, mom, and she has a lot of great things going on. I'm so excited that she's going to be bringing together Malika, Jamie, and Dil Nas to share all sorts of stuff with us. Jen, I'm going to bring you on and then I'm going to work my hardest friends to go between the speakers as they're speaking, but I need a favor. If for some reason 
someone speaking, but I'm showing the other face, just drop me a message and let me know I'm on the wrong person. Jen, it's all you. Tell us all about all the great things you have going on. Well, first of all, Al, thank you so much. Um, it has been such a joy to get to know you um, through your work and your passion uh, for the issues that matter most to our communities. And it is honestly an honor just to be with this incredible group of women. I wish I could have all 41 of you on the screen at one time. Um, you all are the mountain movers, the change makers in our communities. You are uh, the fuel behind everything that, um, that we do in the legislature. And, and we you know, truly could not do this work without all of you. Many of you I worked with um, in my role as an immigration attorney before coming to the General Assembly. I am the only immigrant lawyer in the Illinois General Assembly, currently serving in my second term, um, and very proud to be part of one of the largest and most diverse women's caucuses in any state legislature in the United States. Um, the Illinois uh, legislature in the House is 38% women, but House Democrats, uh, women make up 52% of our caucus. Uh, we are the majority of uh, Illinois House Dems um, and a powerful and diverse group of women that I am so proud uh, to serve with. Um, so lots going on in the Illinois House this year. In January, as part of the organization of the 102nd General Assembly, we elected a new Speaker of the House for the first time in nearly 50 years. And I am proud to say I supported my colleague, Emmanuel Chris Welch. Speaker Welch represents true progress in Illinois and as women are often catalysts for change, this was definitely true in this case. I was proud to be one of a small group of women who stepped up um, among the first to call for change and leadership in the Illinois House. And Speaker Welch is the first African-American Speaker of the House in Illinois' 202-year history. He brings a unique perspective and leadership that is invaluable to the Illinois House as we seek to combat racial inequity and anti-Blackness in our communities. Speaker Welch has fought to expand access to health care for Illinois families, has been a staunch ally of environmental organizations, has been a leader in protecting programs, um, and, and uh, has been a champion for women's rights. Um, I am proud uh, to serve under um, our new speaker. And I also uh, thrilled to have had the opportunity after passing uh, rules to work remotely in committee to get back to work passing legislation um, that was put on hold uh, because of the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, this year, I will be serving um, as both the chair of the newly created House Immigration and Human Rights Committee, and I, I was recently appointed to chair the House Judiciary Civil Committee in the House. Um, and as part of my work this year, um, I have a number of, of measures that I'm really proud of, but one that I do want to highlight for all of you tonight, and that is House Bill 376, which is the TEACH Act. It is teaching equitable Asian American community history. In light of the uh, rise in anti-Asian hate and violence, um, I can think of no better way to combat hate than with education. Uh, we already teach American history. All we are asking is that Asian American history be included as part of the teaching of inclusive American history. The other bill that I wanted to bring to all of your attention, actually there are two, um, that involved the right to counsel for immigrants in Illinois. Um, the first is House Bill 25, uh, which was the first bill that I passed out of committee this session, which is this, establishes the task force on counsel and immigration proceeding, uh, um, immigration proceedings which would study the implementation of universal representation for individuals subject to removal proceedings in Illinois, providing access to, to counsel um, and access to justice has truly been the work of my life. Um, so I'm incredibly proud to start the process of providing access to counsel for immigrants um, in removal proceedings in Illinois. Um, I am also the chief, uh, the chief sponsor of House Bill 2790, Defenders for All, which would authorize the Cook County Public Defender's Office to represent individuals in removal proceedings. 
If we are successful in passing this legislation, we would be the first state in the United States to provide publicly funded counsel for immigrants and removal proceedings, making Illinois truly one of the most welcoming and one of the most um, effective at providing access to justice for those in need. Um, so I'm incredibly proud to be the sponsor for both of those initiatives um, and incredibly proud to uh, serve a community um, that's, that represents the values that um, I think represent the best of, of us all. Um, and so I'm incredibly proud to introduce uh, three powerful women um, who have put their passion and their muscle um, for the work that they do to our, for our communities. Um, Dylan Nas, um, can I, I, I don't know, Alexandra, can you um, spotlight her for a minute so she can wave and say hello? Jamie Baum. Al, can you put the spotlight on Jamie so she can, there we go. Um, and Malika Gardner is also, also with us tonight. Can you put the spotlight on Malika? Excellent. Got me um, on my toes, I'm ready. All right, uh, so here we go. Um, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time talking. I want all of you to get to know these incredible, powerful women. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think I wanna open it up and, and give each um, an opportunity just to share a little bit about the organizations um, that they uh, have um, created and, and through which they're able to uh, create change and uh, provide a catalyst um, for the work that they do. So uh, Dylan, as if you would just tell us initially a little bit about your organization and, and what inspires you. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the New Trier Democrats for creating this forum for us to speak about civic engagement, North Shore women and activism. I'm so honored to be here. Um, there's tons of energy for a Monday evening. I, I just love it. Um, I also wanted to start off with just saying that I'm an immigrant, I'm a female, I'm a South Asian, I'm a Muslim, and I'm passionate about creating a just community. And I think about all of our ancestors. I think about um, Coretta Scott King and Betty Shabazz and Dr. King that really did the civil rights movement um, and did so much legwork for us to be where we are today. So I'm here today in many facets. I'm here as the Muslim Community Center Interfaith and Outreach Committee Chair. So I talk about the interfaith dialogue and I talk a lot about like how we do building of bridges to be here today. But I'm also here as a, an educator, an educator of equity and making sure that we are talking about how important it is to exactly what you said, Jennifer, making sure stories are told by the person that wants to tell the stories, not someone else, making sure that the curriculum is honest and true to what we're doing. So I do a lot of equity work as well. So those are the two um, areas that I'd like to talk about today, equity work as well as interfaith dialogue. Thank you so much, Dilmez, for that introduction to your work. And I you know, hope we can take a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, but I did want to um, give Jamie an opportunity to talk a little bit about Invest to Elect, um, share a little bit about your organization. Thank you. And thank you to, um, to the host, Alexandra, for pulling this event together. I know um, speaking on behalf of Invest to Elect, we're thrilled to be part of this this grouping of, of, of powerful and activist women. Um, I am not a founder of Invest to Elect. I am one of the founding members, um, but I'm pleased to see that about 25% of the participants on this call are my fellow Invest to Elect members. So um, here's to ITE. Um, Invest to Elect, uh, our mission is to bring women to the political table and to support pro-choice Democrats to federal office. We are not a PAC. Um, our contributions go directly to candidates. We also um, have just initiated a new, um, a new part of our organization where we're going to be looking at organizations that, we, that help us reach that goal of getting Dems into federal office. Um, we host events. Um, that with candidates and with members of organizations, we give our, our members access to education, to um, events, to candidates, um, 
coming up in just the next week or so, we have an event for Maggie Hassan. And then um, on May 12th, we're doing one for Catherine Cortez Masto. So um, a great group of women. Um, and I would encourage you, to, I'll put the Invest to Elect logo in there. And I encourage anyone to um, get in touch if you're interested. Thanks so much, Jamie. And then I just wanted to uh, introduce Malika Gardner. Um, I know you are carrying the torch for We Will, and you are also uh, Evanston Live TV's host and founder. And if you could just tell us a little bit about um, both of those roles and what inspires you. Okay, thank you again. I think I put it in the chat, but thank you all so much for this invite. And um, gosh, I hope to attend the, the next one. It's a lot of energy <laughs> on, this, on this Zoom. I like, I love it, absolutely love it. Um, Yes, I'm, I'm on the board of We Will. As everyone knows, Alexandra Eidenberg, she's the founder of We Will. Um, we help women and children get involved in legislation. And it is because of Alexandra that um, I learned how all of this actually works in terms of uh, getting legislation passed. So we got some legislation through on the Black Caucus agenda uh, this year and it passed and it's an education and um, we'll probably talk about that a little bit more uh, later on, but um, I'm really excited about it and I owe we will a great deal because it's changed my life completely and opened the door to so many other things um, that I'm involved in now. Uh, Evanston Live TV, I believe that opened the door to meeting we will to meeting Alexandra. So you never know what God has in store. Um, with Evanston Live TV, I give everyone a platform here in Evanston, you know, just covering amazing people doing amazing things. And um, I thought it was important that people have a voice. I felt like we were missing that here in Evanston. And um, right now I'm covering the Evanston elections, which has gotten a little nasty, a little crazy, a little dirty here. It's been interesting. And, um, and then Evanston Reparations, which I'm, which I'm sure many of you have uh, been hearing about. Uh, it's pretty controversial here in Evanston and that's been um, kind of crazy as well. But um, I'm all about giving people a platform and, um, and bringing some change, some positive change in this world. And I just think we will for, I've learned so much. Thank you uh, for sharing that. And, you know, I think if, for a lot of women, um, at least in my experience, we come to activism through our own life experience, something either in our life experience or our family's life experience. And I'm wondering, and, and, then, and then we're not afraid to kick the door down. You know, we're not afraid to be the first. Um, we're not afraid to, to um, step out into something new. So I'm curious from each of our panelists to hear a little bit about what inspired you um, was it, what was it about your own personal life experience, your story uh, that you'd be willing to share um, with these incredible women who are with us tonight? I don't know, Dilnaz, if you want to kick it off. Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so I think about how when I was growing up, um, I came to Chicago when I was two years old from Heatherbad, India, and we came to Chicago. We were the underserved family. My parents did hourly jobs day to day. Um, I had a mom that worked at night. I had a dad that worked during the day, and it was my sister and I. So my sister and I, we'd walk to school. We'd walk back home, but I knew three things when I walked to school, and the three things that I knew when I walked to school to my Chicago public school, number one one, I hated school. Like I just hated school. No one really understood me at school. I didn't understand what I was doing, but I just disliked school. Number two, my teachers really didn't like me. I could just tell they didn't understand me. They didn't understand my home life when, you know, they talked about Christmas or they talked about um, Easter. I didn't know how to respond to them. And number three, I really had no friends at school. I didn't know how to connect to the classmates because I just lived like this dual life. There was this home where I had these loving parents. My parents like did the South Asian stuff and we had, um, you know, Kitri and Rima and we had unda sandwiches at home. And when I went to school, it was like hot dogs. What is that? Turkey sandwich? I don't get it. So I lived a dual life. And as I was growing up, I just realized no one looked like me. No one sounded like me. None of the books talked about 
the life experiences I had. So a lot of that was what I wanted to do when I grow up, grew up. And I feel like I owned my voice. I wish I owned it earlier, but I think I owned it when I was about 40 ish. And um, it took me a while, but when I owned my voice, it, exactly what you said, Jennifer, I kicked that door down and I'm like, I'm not going to allow someone else to ban me from this country. And I'm not going to allow someone else to tell me what I can do and what I can worship. It's my prerogative. I'm an American. I'm an American Muslim and I'm going to own that voice. So I think it's really important important for all of us to take ownership. And I'm so honored to be in this room where all these women and men are taking ownership. And it's ownership and respect, right? It's respect for what I believe, but it's also respect for what everyone else in this room believes. It's also dignity. It's dignity that I live my life. And it's also the dignity that we all want to share in this community together. So those are areas that the Muslim Community Center, the work that I do with the Interfaith and Outreach Committee, we have monthly webinars um, since the last year. Do you guys remember when we had Easter? We had this virtual Easter. We had this virtual Passover. And then we had the virtual Ramadan. Um, it just started a year ago. But we built that stronger community together. We realized we couldn't physically get together and have an iftar. So how do we virtually get together and have an iftar? Um, the seders. I was so honored to be invited to seders last year as well as this year. How do we have these virtual seders together? And when we do our interfaith dialogue, it's not about a kumbaya moment, but it's really recognizing we have our differences and through those differences, we actually create a more beloved community. We, belo we actually create a more community where there's number one action, there's number two, awareness, and there's number three, education. How do we create that awareness and education that builds that action? And we only do that, Jennifer, and all of us, when we're in spaces where we're really comfortable being uncomfortable, we challenge ourselves to think differently. We challenge ourselves to get proximate to the problem. I remember the first time I went to a synagogue, I was um, probably about 25-ish. The first time I went to a church, I was probably 20-ish. And it was like, wow, I felt really like, am I in the right place? Is this what I should do? And that's when I realized, hey, I need to make sure people come to a mosque and feel comfortable in a mosque. So it's always being comfortable being uncomfortable and challenging people to look at things differently and not having that single narrative. No, thank you so much. I mean, so much of what you just said resonates with me. Strength in our shared experiences, power in supporting one another in, in our um, sharing of our diverse experiences that we can understand and see one another because you can't um, have a dialogue unless you're willing to open yourself up and see one another. So I, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Jamie, what about you? Personal experiences that led you to the work that you do? Sure, sure. Well, I'm happy to share. I was very fortunate that my dad was one of, um, probably ahead of his time, but always made me believe, allowed me to believe that I could do anything that I wanted to do and that I could be anything that I wanted to be. And that, um, having that seed planted at a very early age, it never occurred to me that there would be things that got in my way. And so when I'd run into those obstacles, they were more like um, just things that I needed to figure out how to cope with and then move through it. So um, I, I came from a background where either just because of how I'm wired and because of my environment, I was really fortunate in that way. When I moved to Chicago after college, I was a precinct captain in the 42nd Ward. Um, so I always tangentially after that, after I got married and had a whole bunch of kids, um, I always stayed informed and it was always interesting to me, but I didn't know how to access being more active and how to be more of an activist. Um, and happily for me um, in my community and a number of the founding members of Invest to Elect um, are, were part of my social circle or I've gotten to know them better since in ensuing years, but Invest to Elect was founded um, for women who wanted to be more involved in the political realm and the financial annual financial contribution was accessible to me in a way that I hadn't previously felt like I could get involved in a way where I wasn't just spending $1,000 to sit at a table in a ballroom with a 1,000 other people. 
and best to elect gave me greater access. So I'm maybe one of 50 people in a room with a candidate. And um, that felt very powerful. And we're talking about powerful women here. And certainly there is power in our numbers. And my experience with Invest to Elect has been that that power has a lot of impact. And um, it's been, um, it's certainly enriched my life, um, not just being engaged in a more active way, but certainly the women that I've met as being part of it. Thank you so much. Malika, um, curious about, you know, what was it about um, your own life experience that brought you to wanting to give others a platform to share theirs? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll go with the uh, getting involved with um, We Will. Um, starting Evanston Live TV, I mean, I just came back from LA and I moved back to Evanston and I realized we just didn't have a platform. So I felt I needed to fill that void. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty much why I did what I did. I love hearing other people's stories. And um, I think it's important that people get their stories out there. But getting involved in We Will, um, Alexandra had asked what would be one of the first things I wanted to do. And my whole thing was systemic racism. And I can totally relate to Dilnaz, if I'm saying her name correctly. Okay. Yeah, I hated school for the same reasons, <laughs> the exact same reasons. I felt so misunderstood. Um, I started out on the south side of Chicago, you know, it was all black students, had no problems, but then I came to the north side and, and it was like culture shock. And uh, it was only a few of us, a few black students in the class. And um, all of my best friends ended up being from all over the world, Le Lebanon, Japan, Russia. And it was a beautiful experience, but uh, the teachers, I, I totally felt like I was treated differently. And in the history classes, I didn't see representation of myself. I only saw stories of slavery. And fortunately, my family told us more of our history, which gave me more of a sense of myself. But I noticed in other Black children, they didn't have that. And so I saw the difference. I saw the difference. My Jewish friends, they had Hebrew school. They had more of a confidence about themselves. They had more of a sense of self, of their culture, their religion. Um, and, you know, we, we didn't have that unless you were taught that at home. So growing up, I'm, you know, I heard the other women on here talking about the gun violence. Um, I, I lost my father when I was nine to gun, he was gunned down. Uh, then my stepfather was murdered two years later. Um, I just lost my nephew three years ago to gun violence on the South Side. I'm, I've lost a ton of friends. And with all of that, I take it back to education. And it's about a sense of worth, a sense of self value. And so we will, will always be God sent to me because I had no way of getting that pain, that anger out. I had no way of processing and, and helping my people. I, I, I didn't know what to do. So, I mean, Evanston Live TV, being involved in the entertainment industry all my life, that was, um, it wasn't, it, it's, it's not enough. To me, it, it just felt like it wasn't enough. So we will came at the right time because uh, I could, I felt like I could do more. So when Alexandra taught me this process of how legislation works, I'm like, okay, we're gonna tackle education. And I want, I want all black children to have a sense of self. I don't want them to just think that they came from slavery um, because that makes you feel horrible and makes the other kids look at you like you're beneath them. And the white children feel superior because that's how the books make them appear. Um, and I know that there's more to our history prior to being terrorized. So um, I just, I, I wanted to make it mandatory that the schools throughout the state of Illinois teach pre-enslavement who black people were prior to, that we built civilizations and kingdoms and 
you know, we contributed to medicine and literature. We were these amazing people. And I truly believe that that, that will help to build self-worth, self-value, self-knowledge, and create better race relations because other children will come to appreciate who we are and what we've contributed to this world and what we still contribute to this world. So that has been my inspiration and um, to do the work to push for that legislation to get passed. Um, thank God J.B. Pritzker signed off on it. Um, our language is still in it. <laughs> he signed off on it March 8th. And I, it's, I just truly believe it's going gonna, it's gonna to help kids for generations to come. And that means the world to me, the absolute world to me, because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do with this pain, with this anger. Uh, Evanston Live TV is a, is, it's a great platform for people here in Evanston. Um, it provides a voice for everyone. Um, but that legislation was, was very healing for me <laughs> personally uh, to help my people. And then, um, and then the other bill was, was an inclusive American history bill um, to include everyone's history. I think it's important. And um, it was a fight to get that done. Alexandra knows, Erica knows. It was a fight. People did not want the truth of our history told. But uh, it's, it's important. And I, and I really believe that it's going to start to chip away at systemic racism. And that's been my inspiration. Thank you so much, Malika, for sharing that. And, and Dilnaz and Jamie, um, there is so much power in our own stories. Um, and it, it, that's, that, I think, is, is the fuel and, and the catalyst for change. Um, Al, I don't know what, how are we doing on time? I want to make sure that I'm respectful of everybody's time. Sure. So we are over on time, yet I know that I'm really enjoying hearing from everyone. I don't want to go too far over. How's everyone with a couple questions from the audience and then maybe we can hang out with those that want to stay longer? Does that feel good for people? That works for me. Now, I don't know if you've been watching the chat. Do we have some questions in the chat for? Right now, now we have some very moved participants that have been listening, but we don't have any questions yet. Does anyone want to drop a question in the box or raise their hand to ask a question live? I will say um, something came to mind when Malika was sharing the importance and the value and, and the, the difference that it makes for children to see um, themselves as the whole human beings that they are and, and, and their history. Um, one of the, you know, it kind of brings me back to, to where you started, Al, um, tonight with um, what we can all do. And, and what's immediately in front of us is the municipal elections. And I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't remind everybody how critically important it is to have uh, elected officials at all levels of government that reflect our values. Um, school board elections, um, we have a lot of contested school board elections happening right now. Um, and I just want to remind folks that as much as we do in the legislature, um, and I am incredibly proud to have uh, voted for the Inclusive American History Bill. I've supported all of the Black Caucus pillars, and that is just a start. It is just a start um, for doing the repair that we need to do uh, to truly achieve equity in our communities. Um, that, that implementation is really the key. Um, we have um, in our statutes a requirement to teach um, all of our students about the Holocaust, and yet so many graduate from public, uh, public schools here in Illinois, despite that being a requirement, not knowing a thing about the Holocaust. So we have to stay on um, and stay engaged at every level of government, including our school boards, to ensure that um, the work that all of you have done, to ensure that inclusive American history 
uh, past the legislature is then implemented at the local level because that's really where the rubber meets the road. So please make sure that you um, stay engaged. It is our township government. And I know um, Bonnie uh, Khan Ognisanti is, is with us this evening who makes sure that when we pass uh, appropriations to provide resources to those who are struggling to pay their rent, that are struggling to put food on the table. It's our township government that is often um, there. I think Gail Eisenberg is with us. You know, it is our, our local um, township organizations, our school boards that make uh, sure that those resources get to the people who most need them. Um, so I, that's my plug to make sure that all of you get out and vote in the municipal elections, that you stay engaged with your local leaders, um, and, and please reach out, of course, to my office anytime. Um, and we are continuing to work to ensure that um, equal justice under law means what it says it means um, and that it applies equally to everyone. Um, and, and that includes all the work that all of you do at Nutra Democrats. So thank you for giving us all a forum and a platform um, to share these uh, incredible women's, uh, their, their stories, their lives, their work. Thank you for all the incredible work that all of you do every single day. Um, and let's keep at it because our work is never, never done. And I'm so proud to, to be with all of you this evening. Thank you, Representative. We do have a couple questions in the box and I wanted to kind of echo something and bring something together, which is a very important race here in New Cheer Township. First of all, every race is important. I think we can all agree that there's on the line. Um, Representative, you just mentioned the importance of school board. And right now here in New Cheer Township, particularly our high school, the District 23 has a very important race. And if the four people that were caucused do not win, which includes Keith Dronin, Kim Alcantara, um, Abby Das, and Sally, Sally Tomlinson, if these four people do not win, if any of the other people running win, this means that they have a weighted vote in order to support activities that would be, for many of us, what is considered racism. And so this particular race is very important to Nutrier. And so I encourage everyone to punch 141, 142, 143, and 144. And lucky for all of us, they're in order so we can remember them. So if you are on that anti-racism path, this is a very important vote. So I note that, and then I bring it to Bev Cope, who has asked a question, and I'm not sure exactly who it is directed at. So Bev, if you could unmute, I just wanna make sure that we are asking this question correctly for you. Um, Bev, you're asking if um, we're involved in the Illinois Gun Violence Prevention Coalition. And when you ask that, are you asking that of the organizations, the panelists? Is there a particular um, person that we're going for for that one? And Bev, I'm just trying to... Hi. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you. Whoops. <laughs> we had um, a power outage here, so I got on a little bit late. But um, I was directing my question to the representative from Moms Demand Action. I didn't catch your name. Um, but I know sometimes we seem to go separate directions. Um, I'm very involved in People for a Safer Society and also the Illinois um, Gun Violence Prevention Coalition. And I don't usually see Moms Demand Action involved with those groups. So I was just wondering um, if I just miss something or if they don't, if they choose not to, why they don't want to get involved. Because I always think there's more power when we're working together. Carlene, you're on, my friend. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, sure, actually, we have worked a lot with People for a Safer Society. Denise has come to our groups. People in our group have come to People for Safer Society. Just recently, we shared, I shared with Eileen some legislation that we're pulling together witness slips with. We've done uh, advocacy days in Springfield together. I've gone okay. to visit um, representatives with people in People for Safer Society. Oh, good. So, uh, but, so, but are you involved with the statewide organization, the um, you know Illinois Gun Violence Prevention Coalition? Do you partner with them? So Moms Demand Action tries to work with anybody who's heading for the same goals 
And we also encourage individuals to do, you know, go out and be part of anything that is heading in the same direction. We get a lot of legislative news from Illinois Gun Violence Prevention PAC. They were extremely instrumental in getting the red flag law passed, right. in my opinion, and the gun dealer licensing bill passed. They just had some very dynamic leadership and they pulled together an astounding coalition of groups. I, I would just say that on something as long-term as gun violence prevention, I, I've started to tell supporters, this isn't a sprint, it's not a marathon, it's a relay race. So Moms Demand Action even suggests that people step down after three years and start trying to find other leaders. We're in it for the long haul. So I think that's another thing that goes on, depending on who's dynamic, has the time, their job got freed up, <laughs> or they lost their job, then maybe they'll take or, you know, some nonprofit has the money to pay somebody to work on this full time, then they'll take the lead. So that's the way I've seen it happening over the last three years. Thanks, Carleen. Okay. Bev, thank, thank you for your question. So much um, coalition work to be done. And for those of you, I feel like that, that teacher in me, I feel like I learned what a coalition was about maybe like 15 years ago, but that's a grouping of organizations or people coming together to accomplish something. And I find so often that there's a coalition for something that an organization, it like almost has their name on it, but somehow they're not in it. So if there's a coalition or an effort you feel that would be appropriate for people to get engaged in, drop that in the chat. And I know that we are going to, uh, I want to wrap up with one more question, but I know that there's a lot of connections already happening here in this room. Um, our committee person, Dean Marigos, had a question for Jennifer. Um, Dean, do you want to ask live? Go ahead, Dean. I, I asked it to unmute. Uh, first of all, Jennifer, congratulations on all the work you're doing on the, for the immigration. My question revolves against legislation down in Springfield to stop Asia, uh, violence against our fellow Asian Americans. Is anything germinating down there in Springfield? Yeah, so um, House Bill 376 um, is the TEACH Act, which is Teaching Equitable Asian American History. Um, and that bill, um, I actually passed out of committee the day after the Atlanta shootings. Um, in my view, the, you know, the, the racialization and the uh, anti-Asian hate starts with a lack of understanding. Um, I think Dilnaz, you know, and, and uh, Malika both spoke beautifully to the issue um, of the, you know, just the, the absence and the invisibility of communities of color and the teaching of a full picture of American history. Um, and my colleagues have been incredibly supportive. Um, Speaker Welch is the uh, number two chief co-sponsor on the TEACH Act. Um, the chair of both the Latino and Black caucuses are co-sponsors of that legislation, um, as is Deb Conroy, the uh, uh, Women's Caucus Whip. Uh, we are united in an effort um, to ensure that uh, the, the full uh, teaching of American history that is inclusive of the diverse experiences that have contributed to American history um, in my view, is the most important thing that we can do to combat hate. Um, it begins with education. It begins with understanding and seeing one another. Um, access to justice in, is, is a, fundamentally about ensuring um, that the most vulnerable among us have um, a champion, um, have somebody there to help. Um, and, and that is really the, the foundation for, for most of the work that I do in the legislature. Um, you know, even the work that I do for small business is about ensuring um, that you know, the, the small business owners in our communities that are predominantly uh, women um, are the, the ones who start our small businesses and our communities um, have the resources that they need to continue to do um, the work that they do. 
um, to make our community stronger. So, um, you know, please uh, reach out and get involved. Um, let us know uh, the, the issues that you're passionate about. There have been some incredible women who have talked tonight about the issues and the organizations that they are passionate about. Um, so I would encourage everyone um, to get involved um, and to continue to support one another in the work that we do. Um, we are truly stronger together. And I am so proud to be a member of this extended community um, in, in New Trier on the North Shore. Um, it is an honor to, to be among all of you um, incredible human beings. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Um, and we're very excited to support your bill. Everyone, I dropped a link into um, the chat that has the link to the bill we're just speaking about, which is HB 376, the Asian American History Bill. And speaking of coalitions, Jennifer has built a very broad coalition of her colleagues to support this. And it does look like it's going to be coming up to witness slip soon. And you guys can do a witness slip if you believe in this one and this one's yours. I think this is an important one to sign on to. Um, and just it is so needed in this time. And so, Dean, thank you for your question. Um, what I ask everyone to do is this is that time period where I take a lovely picture of everybody. And so if you could put your camera on and just pretend like you're totally camera ready, I'm going to get a picture of all of us. And then I will later share this, of course, with everyone. But this has just been um, such an amazing crew of people. And I agree for, for a Monday night, we sure are lively friends. So if I could just have your smiling faces over here, that would be awesome. With Judy's blessing, this might even end up in our newsletter. So... <laughs> Um, everyone, thank you. There are just so many terrific men and women in this room, this virtual space, and I can feel the follow-up that's coming. Um, please connect with each other, support each other. Here at New Chair Democrats, we definitely want to help support you, your organization, and your efforts, and we're just grateful for everyone being here. I know that half the fun of Zooming is the after party. If you have to hop to something like taking care of the kids, having some dinner, whatever it might be, please do. This is your moment to exit. If you're an after party fan and you want to talk more about the equity in our communities, the issues in our communities, and coming together. We're here. So I'm going to leave it open for us to hang out for a little bit longer, but this is the official wrap. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, thanks for those. Who thanks. I just want to say that I think that we're so dynamic tonight because it's Passover and it is the holiday of freedom for everybody. And that is what we all work for. So <laughs> next year in a peaceful, free, open world. Nice. Awesome job, Alexandra. Yeah, Thank it was you. Beautiful. It was really interesting. You know, I, I What's going on in this world is really troubling to me. I, you know, when I was in college, I went to um, the University of Wisconsin, and the first thing I did is I had a, uh, a United Nations Day, and I thought, oh, that would be interesting. I'll meet to meet people from all over uh, the world. So I signed up, and then they assigned you what country you were going to be. The, the member of at the United Nations. So here I am, Jewish girl from Chicago. Guess what country I got? United Arab Republic. <laughs> and when you were a, a, that member, you had to vote on the issues as if you were a member. You know, you got to learn. I got to meet people from all over the world and I found them to be interesting, not frightening, not they were different, yes, but they were interesting. And so that's what led me into my job working for the airlines where I traveled by myself right. all over the world and yeah. met people. So and interesting. And Dilnaz, I think of when I went to, uh, I lived in Paris for about seven years and to learn French, I had to go to an international school. And I met so many Iranians because it was a long time ago and they had fled their country. And I learned the history of America from the Iranians when they told us, who told me about the CIA. Oh, yes. the, oh, they, the CIA overthrew the legitimate 
government. Terrible. He to set up the puppet government. I was a political science major. I had graduated and I never knew that. So just to say, um, it's so interesting when you hear people tell you about your own country and then you learn your history. Yeah, but the honest history. <laughs> well, I, I, Judith, I think a lot of what you said resonated with me as well. It's interesting. I think we're built on this fear and, you know, America does a great job of building fear and a lot of us do live in fear. But I also think about like how we need to break that, right, and transfer it into hope. So I, I just said how I went to the, my first synagogue or my first church and I would always tell my parents um, pretty regularly, oh, I'm going to this synagogue or I'm going to this church. And every time I'd say it, you know, for a, a good, I swear, like, 10 years, they'd be like, oh my God, what is wrong with you? I don't understand this. Why do you need to go to a church? Why do you need to go to a synagogue? They kept thinking there's something wrong with that. So that's like the mindset my parents have. So now my, Bev, you know my mom and dad. So mom, now my dad is 81 and my mom is 77. And but pre-COVID, pretty much every week, I either go to a church or a synagogue. So they would, for the last two to three years, they've gone with me every single week to a church in a synagogue. And if I don't call them now, they're like, wait, you're not going anywhere? I said, yeah, I am going. I just, I, you don't have to come with me. And they're like, why wouldn't you take us? I don't understand that. And I'm like, oh my God, mom and dad, you don't have to come with me to every single place I go to. So it's funny how my parents changed because I literally would just talk to them. Oh, this is what I did at a synagogue. This is what I learned. And they're like, they just just kept asking more and more questions. So I think it's really important that we stop living in fear of each other and start start living in hope and love with each other because that's how we're going to make those changes. And that's why I say I was really uncomfortable the first time I went to a church in a synagogue. And I'm sure the first time anyone goes to a mosque, it feels a little uncomfortable, but like you just keep doing it. And I think, you know, it takes a while and you realize, wow, there's beauty in every place that you go to that is a faith-based place. Yeah. yeah. When I was uh, at Roosevelt University, there was a lot of students there uh, from uh, Iraq and, uh, all, uh, and from Africa and all different countries. And uh, there was a young man from Curtis and we were having a big international day at Roosevelt. This was back in the 60s. I'm real old. I'm as old as your parents, older than your parents, your mother at least. And um, he came to me and asked if I would, uh, he was from Kurdistan, which of course, you know, the Iraqi students were <laughs> thrilled with him, I guess. I didn't know the history, but he asked if I would wear the costume of his country at the international day. And I, I was honored to, and it was beautiful. And he was, it made him so thrilled that I, that I agreed to wear his, his costume and represent his country. And, and for me, it was just really fun to get dressed in this beautiful costume. And, and, and these are the things that make, that I wish more Americans would be like, instead of living in fear of people who are different, but learning to accept people who are different because it makes your life so much richer and so much better. And, and it just makes me sad to see what this country is becoming, you know, in the, in the hate that has been, was generated in the past four years. It just is very upsetting to me. I was very lucky because so many of my friends in college, one of my friends was Methodist and very traditional and went there. One of my friends, I went to a Passover Seder I investigated, you know, traditional Christianity, and then part of my family is Catholic, so I was exposed to that. I went to my cousin's bat mitzvah, so I feel very lucky to be exposed to all that. Just exactly what you say, Judy, and what you were saying before. Beth, what has a hand up? Oh, Beth? Thank you. Um, I feel like an interloper of sorts because I don't live in New Trier Township. I actually live in Morton Grove, so that's me. Welcome wherever you're from. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I find you have a really interesting group. I get the newsletter and I've attended other, other of your events. But as far as breaking out of your bubble and meeting people from different groups, I think it's so important. I think that's one of the key reasons we don't understand each other because we tend to stick with our own kind at least i know as a jewish person growing up we just stuck with our own people and i was did not get a chance really to branch out and meet people from different communities 
um, until I was older. And then especially um, within the last five or six years, uh, Morton Grove started this amazing group, um, two women, a Muslim woman and a Jewish woman, started Morton Grove Women Who Drink Tea right after Trump um, was elected. Um, when the Muslim ban, you know, he was doing the Muslim ban and making all sorts of horrible threats. And they had been friends and they decided to form this group to come together to, you know, to support the Muslim community. And I've been to, um, our, we have a mosque on the other side of Morton Grove and it's a fabulous place. Dil Dilnaz is very involved there. And I've met so many amazing people. They're, you know, they're just wonderful, warm. And, you know, we were given so many fearful ideas at one time about what, you know, the Muslim community was like. And it's, I don't know, totally a bunch of lies and um, just so prejudicial. It's terrible. And this is an amazing group. We have women from all walks of life, um, all religions, and we just have the best time and we do a lot of really great things for our community. So I'm really very proud of being a member of that group. That's excellent. I think that's a wonderful thing and more people should do that. I also, when I was in college, dated a Muslim guy. So I, I spent a lot of time, I ate a lot of good Muslim food at his sister's house. So I, I just find that people who are different than you expand you and you, you absolutely get to, yeah and, it, and it's just so much fun i mean i i yeah. I, I, I was at the arab nightclub learning the deaf guy and i mean he, he, they, one of their friends said two weeks with me and i and i'll have you making 200 dollars a week doing the belly dance i said yeah like we could fill me as little israel or something <laughs> so but people people are afraid of the unknown and that's and that's uh, the fault of our country because we we tend to uh, make people feel more comfortable in their life with their own and I and it's too bad because it's such a rich country because of all the different people right. that come here and, and there's a lot, there should be more opportunities for